So welcome to this brief overview of yeast propagation relevant to brewing applications. What we're going to do is have a quick look at yeast features and we're going to look at how we can relate that to culturing up and getting a good fermentation. So this is just general background. We probably know a lot of this. Um, we're talking about yeast as a single celled fungus. We know it's essential for fermentation. We can get top and bottom fermentations according to whether it's not just ale or lager, but the way it's been treated and developed and um, really evolved within our fermenters. We've got many strains available, 3,000, many that we can isolate and we can obtain from various sources. And we've got a variety of flavour options which are available. And we can reuse the yeast for some generations until perhaps there's a contamination or it mutates and we get a drift in characteristics. And some further details, we know that yeast is dimorphic, so it does show two different forms very often, a filamentous and a yeast form. And that, to a degree, um, is an indication of the, of the species, to, to some degree, and whether there's stress on the yeast. In natural communities, if we were doing a wild fermentation, we'd get a succession of yeast going through different species according to the stage of fermentation. And we've got within Saccharomyces at least anaerobic metabolism, um, but it does require oxygen at the beginning of fermentation to produce sterol synthesis to assist the membranes to develop and metabolise. Um, however, oxygen does increase the cell yield, so that we use that when we do our propagation. And we've got, of course, those distinct ale and lager species, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Saccharomyces pastorianus. And in our propagation, we're looking to get the right cell count for the pitching requirements. Uh, we want to target that and we want to culture up to the right point. We've got to keep it pure. We don't want contamination of bacteria or wild yeast. We want the yeast to be viable, to be alive. We want the yeast to be vital, to be metab metabolically active um, and then grow. And we don't want to stress the yeast too much because we'll get anomalous metabolisms. Now, there's a feature with regard to the amount of yeast that we would add into a culture to propagate it up. Um, and if we add too little, we're not going to get enough growth. And in fact, if we'd add too much, we're going to get more metabolism than growth. Now, this shows a bit of that profile. And in fact, um, just looking there, we should have a zero. Well, the zero there should be one. Um, if we just add one, um, 10 to the 7 counts is what we get at the end. So if we have a small inoculum level, um, then we're going to get very, very little growth. But if we have a medium inoculum level, we'll get um, a variable amount, and then a higher inoculation level, we'll get the target growth. So we must make sure that we get the right amount going into the brew. Now, a desirable pitch or let pitching level is somewhere between 10 and 20 million cells per mil, or we could say 1 million cell per degree Plato, or per 4 degrees gravity. So our target um, might be, say, 10 million um, cells per mil if we've got something like a 1040 wort beer uh, gravity. So for 20 litres, we multiply that 10 million by 20 times 1,000, because we've got 1,000 mils in a litre. So we're going to end up with 200,000 million or 200 billion. So the typical productivity in one batch, if we just grew yeast up in a fermentation, we get somewhere in the region of 50 million cells per mil. So doing the division there, we're going to need around about 4,000 mils or 4 litres of standard fermentation. Now, that's the sort of target um, that we want. <clears throat> now, if we take our yeast from a yeast slope, which we supply at Brewlab, we might get about 1,000 million cells from that. But it's nowhere near enough to pitch 20 litres. We're going to need 200 times that. Um, however, if we inoculate into sort of progressive growths, we will be able to build it up. So if we inoculate and grow in 100 mils, we'll produce probably 10 times the initial amount if we aerate. Now that just really means if we, sh if we make it shaken um, and we give it good, good exposure to oxygen, to the air, um, through a, a bung of some sort that will filter out contamination. So we'll go from 1 million cells um, to 10 million, million cells. And if we pitch that into, say, 2 litres, we'll produce another 10 times per mil if aerated. So we'll go to um, 100 million cells, which is um, 100 billion. So we'll be in the region, perhaps not quite, but we'll have to double that to get 4 litres. Um, and what we want to look at is the growth curve of this. So if we go from um, inoculation through the growth 
um, profile, the growth curve, will get slow growth initially, then exponential growth, and then it'll tail off into stationary phase and death phase. So what we want to do is make sure that we are not um, taking yeast in our culture system in the death phase um, or in the really the stationary phase. We want to target this point at the top of the exponential phase and avoid that part when it's stationary. So what we want to do is use step cultures to go from a slope into a culture, 100 mil say, grow that to the maximum point, not let it go further, pitch that into another brew, um, two litres, um, and then grow that to the maximum point, and then use that to pitch into the final fermentation that we want. So we can go through that, and if we take it se sequentially, we're going to start with 10 million cells. We're going to go to 100 million cells um, per, uh, per mil, uh, we'll culture that for 24 hour, 48 hours. We'll get 1,000 million cells per mil, which is 100,000 mil, million cells in total in that 100 mil. We'll pitch it into 2 litres. Um, we'll grow that for 24, 48 hours. And we'll get 500 um, million cells per mil, variously. Um, could be more, but we could get up to 100,000 million cells per mil. So somewhere between 2 and 4 litres will give us enough to pitch a full 20 litre brew. So it sounds a lot, and we can manipulate that, and it will vary according to a variety of factors, some of which would be the strength of the wort, some of which would be the oxygenation, and so on. But in this sort of sequence, we'd be getting a reasonable run-through. Um, got to bear in mind, of course, that um, the, te the features like temperature as well will control how quickly this happens. When we say 24 to 48 hours, well, we've got to be careful we don't overshoot that or undershoot it, really. Now we can keep a track of it, we can monitor cell counts, um, but we need a microscope and we've got to use probably a 400 times and a hemocytometer so that we can count the cells, um, which can be difficult sometimes with pitching yeast because it's quite concentrated and often flocculated together. But we can increase the productivity if we aerate up the cultures, um, shaking it um, either continuously or intermittently, and that will increase the yield um, maybe by five times again. So wide mouth flasks give exposure to the air, agitation and aeration. So large flasks and eventually we'd go into a conical flask like this, which would give us the large bulk scale, which would pitch you into a commercial um, operation. But we might just use those um, two flasks there to pitch in to a proper, um, we might say, 20 litre brew. Now, a couple of the factors which we'd also want to keep a track of is our worts want to be identical or comparable to the final wort. If we grew it up just in sort of simple sugar, glucose, sucrose, then we get very different metabolism. And in fact, that would probably not um, give us a very good productivity necessarily. Um, we'd want a gravity somewhere between 1030 to 1060. So if we're using wort, it's going to be a low wort to begin with, and maybe going up to a higher wort later. But the higher the wort is, the stronger, the more stressed the yeast will be. And a range of sugars, not just glucose or sucrose dominant. We want some maltose so that the yeast is used to fermenting that. If we can use hopped wort, it's good because we'll inhibit bacterial growth. And if we can supplement it with something like zinc, but it's got to be very careful because it's a very low concentration that we'd need to use that. So it's not worth getting some zinc and just pitching it in. We need to have it formulated properly in the solution. And here's just confirmation of the effect of alcohol on the viability of yeast. Um, if we have different alcohol levels and we look at the viability of yeast um, in culture, then we get low viabilities at the high alcohol levels here, but high viabilities at 5 or 6. Now, you're going to get 5 or 6% from a 10, 50, 60 works. That's perhaps a bit high anyway, but we certainly don't want to be culturing in a 7 or 8% alcohol condition. If we use oxygen, we're going to get less alcohol anyway. And we want to minimise our contamination by using aseptic techniques, of course. So we're going to use, if we can, a flame. It could be a Bunsen, but it could be a gas flame, gas burner, um, and uh, streak out the yeast from the slope. We could put some wort into that slope. We could streak it and loosen the cells and then pour that into the flask aseptically around the flame. And the same if we're using a larger bulk scale of production. And we want to keep an eye of the product production because at the critical early stages any contamination is going to mag be magnified so we don't want anything like this which is filamentous yeast and if you look in the background we've got bacteria um, here's a more magnified view of lactic acid bacteria you can see the characteristic shapes of those rod shells cells when we've got yeast in there so that's a very poor culture 
Um, and here's a, here's a culture of yeast which, on the face of it, might look okay, but look at those long, elongated yeasts. They're either stressed culture yeast or they're wild yeast. So a good microscope will show us those features. And again, things that we don't want, well, here's good examples of yeast. They have, this is a chaining yeast, which may not be good, but it's in a balance with this yeast, so it's a dual culture. But here we've got dead cells, old cells, very um, vacuolated and so on. Here we've got wild yeast, certainly don't want that. And here we've got a agar plate showing us mixed colonies, which might be both brewing yeast, but on the other hand, one might be a contaminant yeast. And we can test the viability with the hemocytometer and the sample of yeast with methylene blue. So methylene blue stains dead cells blue, but the live cells uh, uh, reduce the, the dye and stay uh, colourless. Um, here's some an experiment we've done with different yeast, um, eight different yeasts, two ales, two lagers, two wheats, two ciders, um, growing in 1040 wort, in 1080 wort. We've done an acid wash and we've done an oxygen um, purge. And it's very clear that the stronger worts, not that clear, but the stronger worts do slow the growth. The acid wash does slow the growth as well. The hydrogen peroxide is giving a big, acid, big um, oxygen dose and it's killing off the yeast. So long storage of yeast in exposure to oxygen, whether it's dried yeast or whether it's culture yeast, um, will eventually kill the yeast. So that's the um, approach, uh, a few general background features of propagation. Here's just a few extra bits on yeast and looking at uh, fungal evolution, really, that um, we're going back a thousand million years um, when fungi developed and we've got two big groups, the Ascomyces, Basidiomyces, different um, subgroups developed from those and the Saccharomyces um, then further developed. So if we put that on a time scale, looking here, going through that um, 1500 million years. We've got the Basidiomyces, the Ascomyces and so on. Eventually the Saccharomyces come through with all these little other ones like Candida and so on. Um, and at the same time we've got the animals developing, the mushrooms and smuts and rust and things. Um, but at this point we get a change in the genetics where the Saccharomyces whole genome duplicates and gives us a wide variety of additional genes which partly allow the Saccharomyces to become adapted to growing in high sugar concentrations which will be found in flowers and fruits of plants. So there's a lot of convergent, convergent evolution, uh, parallel evolution going on here. Now if we look in the natural um, locations, the origins of yeast, we've got a lot of fruit and um, will have natural yeasts on it. So here's examples of the colonies of yeast on the surface of fruits. We can isolate them on cultures. We can look at them in the microscope. We can characterize them. Um, here's an example of that same fruit looked at in the high microscope view. We've got yeast growing with filamentous fungi as well on the surface. We isolated five different yeasts from that. We tried, um, we cultured them in different, um, uh, we cultured them in a 1040 wort with control yeast gave us 4% alcohol. One of those yeasts, one of the Saccharomyces, gave us 3.5%, so that could be a potential um, use in fermentation. The other yeast gave us much less, but were differently flocculated. So you could say this is the community of yeast that we would get if we did a natural wild fermentation from those. It would be very interesting to see the sequence of the communities um, and the characteristics of the flavours. And what we can do then is take the DNA out of them. We can um, sequence that DNA and we can compare it with the uh, genome database to look at the genes in it, to look and identify the species or the strain and so on. So that's where things are sort of headed at the moment with much increasing focus on the molecular biology. And here's some examples of what people are doing on molecular biology and microbiology, isolating particular yeast from um, fruits and tree barks, um, looking at laboratory enhanced production of flavours, recombinant Britannomyces, um, methods for looking at hybrids and so on. So there's a lot of activity in this area. So the future is going to be more awareness of brewing in the microbiology sense, more yeast strains, more yeast species, more genetics, dual multiple strains, genetically modified, potentially engineered yeast, not necessarily GMO'd, but ones which have had the genes looked at and potentially modified. So the future is broad, lots of potential developments in the future um, with our yeast, but of course we've got to look back and make sure we can culture them up and propagate them properly.